Um, can join us today on this beautiful spring day. Um, we are the Seeds of Sustainability. My name is Kristen and this is Scott. We're just members, um, but we're a sustainability club here on campus and we're focused on organic agriculture, um, making available fresh organic food, and promoting healthy, sustainable lifestyles. Um, this is our second workshop of our spring workshop series, um, Seed Starting 101. So um, thank you all for coming today and hope that you will leave here ready to grow. Um, so today Scott and I are going to help you discover the benefits of starting your seeds um, at home. Um, whether it be uh, growing plants, uh, edible plants, flowers, or herbs, um, the benefits can be incredibly rewarding, um, fascinating, and um, really fun. So. Let's start by talking about the benefits. Um, one is we can jumpstart the, the growing season. Um, instead of waiting for the, your Home Depot or your Lowe's to come out with transplants, you can start growing at home. Um, and let's talk about the quality. Who knows when or where or what went into growing the transplants that you're going to buy at these stores. But starting your seeds at home, you'll have control over the quality of your transplants and you can ensure that you're growing um, organic from seed to plant, or seed to finish. Um, and also you have a greater variety of seeds to choose from. Oftentimes at these um, big garden box centers, you only have you know, a limited selection. And when you go into organic, it becomes even, even less of a selection. So starting your seeds at home, you can choose from a whole array of Seeds. You can choose to do heirloom, you can choose to try something unique like jicama, you know, something that they wouldn't normally have at uh, your, your big garden center. Um, so. so I like to think of this process um, similar to um, a great recipe. And before you start your recipe, you want to, you know, assemble all your ingredients so you're not running all over the place. Um, so there's, there's a few things you want to you um, remember before you start. One very important thing is to um, find out your last frost-free date for your region. And I um, believe ours here is early May. And you want to know that information because you're going to start your seeds um, at home six weeks before your last frost-free date. Um, another important thing to know is to become familiar with what zone you're in because there are um, specific varieties that are better suited to specific zones. Um, in this area we are about a zone five? I five to six? It can range from five to eight. Actually, it depends on, on they the actually just, windows. They actually yeah. just changed the zoning. But you can find that information online very easily. Um, Johnny's is a seed catalog and they, they have a lot of great information on their website even if you're not buying seeds from them. That's right. And another... JohnnySeeds.com. Oh, JohnnySeeds.com. That's right. Yep. It's JohnnySeeds.com if you want to write that down. A lot of the information I found that you guys might be familiar with is the Organic Gardening Magazine. They have a great website too. Um, and another handy tool that I find is kind of helpful to have is a seed starting chart because that'll kind of break down, if you're new to this, um, which seeds to, to start inside and which to directly sow. And um, it also help you keep track of, you know, what you've planted, when, and so you can track and compare for next season. Um, so we're gonna go right into soil. And um, it's important, the type of soil you use is not potting soil. Potting soil is oftentimes way too heavy and um, it doesn't drain very well. So you want to look for um, a soil starting mix or there are resources online where you can um, blend your own. And did everybody? Yep. Alright. So I'm going to talk um, a, little, a lot of the steps because we're a sustainability group. I thought it'd be great to talk about not just using the cells and uh, plastic 
but to use things that we already already use a lot of people use like egg cartons a lot of people just throw them out some people save them but it's better to save them because you can start seeds right in you could actually when you transplant you don't even have to take them out of the cartons you could put it right into the ground it'll actually just be another uh, organic matter that will help fertilize the soil um, also good thing is like fruit cups and yogurt cups um, no recycling is awesome but if you could use it a couple times before you recycle it why not size bag of perlite at home. Can I extend the amount of soils of seed starting mix I have by mixing in uh, something like that? Definitely, definitely. Uh, perlite and vermiculite stuff is, is great for the soil because it helps uh, create uh, aeration and stuff like that. And if some of the seeds that I have are of my own from like last last year, do, should I put them in the refrigerator to like uh, is that part of the preparation? I think it's probably you could just store in a, a cool, dark, dark place. Dark. There are there is information online where you know if you can look at the specific the, varieties and the expiration dates. Usually, it's like one to two years. They stay good. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes, like I have lots of expired um, seeds that were donated, and I used those last year. And you're just going to plant more of those, um, just in, you know, just yeah. in case. But just know that if you're going to do it all the time, you know, it's something that's important to you. That if, if you, you are using older seeds, you know, you might not get the same germination, germination rate that you would if you had, you know, fresh seeds. I just used a pack of seeds from 1996 and got really good germination. If seeds um, have been genetically modified, are they required, or if it came from a genetically modified plant, are they required to put that on a seed package? No. So but that's a problem as, if you're as not buying organic. Yes. Well, under the organic USDA organic standards, one of the criteria is non -GM, no yeah. GMO seeds. Right, but if you don't buy an organic seed, oh. you have no idea if it's been treated. No. Don't. There is a list of, of genetically modified seeds. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's corn and, and grape seed and soy. So, unless Monsanto's sneaking something in, which I wouldn't doubt it, um, you know, they can just go to that list or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's why they have the certification because you want to, if you want to make sure 100%, usually if it's certified, there's a good chances are very very good that it's it's good um, let's keep going going like I uh, mentioned we have cells plastic cells they're pretty inexpensive but and you could reuse them which is good but if you can use stuff that you already have it's probably better out better than keep purchasing plastics um, soil blocks is another thing um, usually these are around like $30 or so, different prices you could find them for, but these are so you can make these without the plastic. We'll, we'll demonstrate that in a little bit. There's uh, new cells that they're making now, which is made out of coconut uh, fibers. It's a lot, a lot more sustainable than plastic and also peat. Uh, pots, but the thing with peat is usually to get the peat they have to destroy some kind of wetlands because they have to dredge all that. How about cow pots? <laughs> cow pots are actually very good. Um, they're, they're pretty sus that's they're sustainable, but um, the, the expense is, is what gets a lot of people. If, you, if you're doing it at home in a small garden, you might, you know, spend the extra extra money for it, but once your operations are getting bigger, it's, it's tougher to, to use that. So a lot, a lot of the farms will use, the, use the cell blocks. You ready to start demonstrating? So I'm passing out um, you know, little cups if you guys want to plant something. 
We're going to create little mini greenhouses for you to take home. Um, wow. If you're interested, we have some organic seeds. Um, Kristen got a lot of great information from uh, OrganicGuarding.com. Um, like I said, JohnnySeeds.com. It has a lot of great information, seed calculators, tons of stuff. It, they can help you plan almost all of your operations just from the information that they give. Do you know any other websites that are um, Fedco is another one. I think they're out of Vermont, Fedco. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of those, those two companies definitely deal strictly in organics, and they have, they're a great resource for compost, um, things like that. So, well, um, to to prepare a lot of your uh, your soil, you wanna you wanna not just do it dry. You wanna get it moist. You don't wanna get it too too um, muddy. You definitely need some some water in there, and um, I'll demonstrate how farmers use this. Usually, these are called flats. What you do is you either you take these and you put these in here, and then you'd have uh, an outer one. This has holes at the bottom, and that's how you, you would water from the bottom as well. But it's also good for uh, good drainage. So basically what they would do is take a flat, take the seed block, get it good into the dirt. Is this the soil you purchased to make seed blocks with or did you make No. Um, we, we mixed our own, but it was, uh, well actually, it was, it was the school's dirt. I don't know. We did purchase some. Which is the stuff that's in, in the, the plant. Uh, Ideally, the soil mix should be sterile, right? Sterile, yes. And is, but how, how important is it? Is it like when you say you mixed your own, is it sterile or no? Well, the one that I'm handing out to you, I just opened the bag today. Yep. This one we use during for classes, stuff, uh -huh. so it's not sterile. Um, there's nothing added to it, like very minimal nutrients. Like if we go out, so, like the idea is don't take soil from outside. From out. You don't yeah. want to use your garden soil. Yeah. Or because yes. you could have diseases and uh, different different things in the soil. If you question um, the organisms in your soil and you don't know if it's aseptic or not, you can uh, just stick it in the oven or the microwave. That's what I do. I mean, I just put dirt. <laughs> 350 for a two hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. 35 minutes will do it. Uh, it's not a bad idea because you have to cook it if you're going to test it. You're going to test your own. You're going to use the, the soil testing kits that the school has. That's one of the first processes. Like, if it's you feel so like contaminated, it's a good idea. To, you're going to do a little bit. I can put it in the microwave. If I've got a little lot, I put it in the other side. Yeah, you could definitely, you could definitely, you could definitely cook your own dirt if you want. Um, if not, you could use compost. Um, so people use sand, uh, perlite, vermiculite. Hey, I feel like if you add compost in there, it kind of covers the base bases. Yeah. Um, so with the C block, you're gonna basically clean off the bottom a little bit. Um, I've seen a couple different methods. Um, but it, some people put it in the middle, but it's good to put it at the end because then when you get the seed blocks out, you could use a spatula or um, 
or a fork or something. Basically what that does is uh, the bottom of this is a little square and you could also get round and they'll make the holes for you already. We're also that has a different use because you could also get a smaller one. A lot of people start um, herbs and stuff in the small seed blocks. Do they have any different name for the tool? Because I've heard plugs. I'm wondering if that size is, if there's a distinction between the names of the different. No? Not the small plugs. Ones are I, th plugs. I think it's just, yeah. Just comes up. It has a lot of time to do that. I yeah. love making seed blocks. <laughs> if anybody needs any, call me up. <laughs> I just love it. I can make seed blocks all day long. But I, I don't know if I'm going to cook dirt, though. I don't think I'll do that. <laughs> Well, if, if well, I oftentimes have a bale that's been out all winter, I didn't use it up, and it's been out all winter, and it's contaminated. I mean, oh, it's I been out there with who knows what in it, leaves and something crawling in it. And if you really don't want it, you know, you want to clean and not clean, you just to cook it. But, um, so the good thing with the small ones is if you start, like, herbs or something small, and you get them started in the small one, then the square hole that you made with the bigger one, you could actually transplant the plant into a, a, to a bigger size, to the next size. And then it even gets better because you can make even bigger ones and this whole thing will drop into it. Wow. So again, it, it's, it's an investment for these, for these products, but you're not going to use as much plastic and uh, it's just, it's simple. So that'll, that'll stay together? You don't need to contain it in anything? Nope. You just... You're gonna, you would keep going down the row. Um, some people do put some kind of space, but you don't have to. You can put them close together. You want enough space where a little bit of air is going to get through, because once roots fail air, they'll stop. They're not going to, like, they're not going to grow up out of the ground. Man. As soon as they feel the air, they're going to stop and they're going to turn. Markets. Yeah. So, the, and the name of that is a, a seed block? Yeah, seed block. Of course. Yep. Um, ah. another, another method that I, I didn't bring up is uh, newspaper. You can use newspaper. You can make your own cells out of newspaper or just regular paper. And that's another source that you can just drop right in and transplant that right into the ground. Um, you could actually buy um, little devices, little wooden devices that will help you make them. But easier easier to make it, you know, I should have brought a bottle. But you can use a bottle and you got to have a few strands because it will it'll weaken up. And you can roll it up and you would fold down the bottom and basically you'd have a, a cup. Yeah. It just matters how much fun and, and time you have. If, if you want, you know, if you have children and you want to make it, uh, you know, good, good, uh, good project, you can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, we have you have some seeds in front of you. Some. A good organic lettuce blend and some basil. If you want to use that, um, we have some other seeds. Oh. When it comes to actually, like after putting the seed in this whatever container or medium, is is light a consideration at all, or is it just warmth? And if and, and what's the like what's the ideal uh, environment for the seed? Once you start, I assume you have to keep this moist all yeah. the time, right? You're one upping us. There I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll definitely get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Oh, you want to get some seeds for <clears throat> So when you're fill, if you're going to use something like this or a reusable container, you just want to make sure that you top the dirt off to the very top. Otherwise, you'll experience what they call dampening off, just like a buildup of mildew or mold, which can hinder the growth of your plant. Um, so fill it to the very top, and then depending on what kind of seed, what, what seed you're going to use, obviously they'll come in different shapes and sizes, but the general rule of thumb is to plant it um, twice the 
twice the depth of the seed. So you just want to tear open your packet and uh, poke a little hole in there using your pinky or pencil eraser is pretty common, popular method. A quarter of an inch is usually uh, it's pretty standard. I mean, it could depend on the seeds. A lot of seeds packets, if you buy from like burpees and stuff, they actually, they'll tell you right on the package. I don't, I, I think these are uh, for our organic programs, so I don't know if they have that information, but usually a quarter of an, uh, a quarter of an inch hole. You don't want to go too big. And I mentioned earlier the handiness of this chart because something like lettuce, um, if you don't know, you wouldn't need to transplant. It's something that doesn't really like to be, you know, taken out of its container and put into the dirt and handle too much. So you, if you're going to plant your lettuce, um, well, I mean, it's good for the little containers and then into a bigger pot, but it's one of those ones that you can just direct seed and expect it to just do its thing. Um, for lettuce, you can just poke a few holes and, yeah, like a little two pinch, holes, two, holes. two to three in each hole. So you're saying we shouldn't the, you know, plant these in here? Ideally, we would plant these directly in the ground, is that what you're saying? You could, you could start um, lettuce, usually um, it's a little bit different of a process sometimes some, with some varieties of lettuce because you don't want to dig it, go too deep. Usually they have you put it close to the top because some lettuce needs uh, more sunlight than, than okay. other varieties of plants. One of the old, old way I learned from my mother is that you put the amount of, and this is just a rule of thumb, and it's just something to go by, but you have a rule of thumb is you put the amount of soil yeah. inside of the seed. In other words, if it's a bean, you put that much soil. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a lettuce seed, you just put a little sprinkle. Yeah. So it's the size of the seed, you put that much soil. No. So that's a little fashion. And with this container, if you're going to do the lettuce, it's easy just to squeeze out of there. It's not too much um, disturbance for the roots, so it's fine. Yeah. So go for it. Yeah, like when blacks, like right in your house, swirling, you got lettuce for anybody else does. Lettuce isn't necessarily after the box. I don't know if you know it. the lettuce bit, don't do it outside, but like if you wanted to grow lettuce down, get it flat. And, and just make, and that's what I do. Well, That's what I'm interested in doing is growing like my own lettuce and yeah. salad vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you could set these all inside. How many seeds did you say? You plant? Usually like two to three seeds per hole. And uh, you could do um, two holes. And what we'll, we'll talk about later is like thinning. So you just make a little hole right It doesn't necessarily have to be directly in the center. But, um, yeah, a couple of seeds per hole. And also, the good thing with a couple of seeds is if you put a couple of seeds in there and you're lucky enough that two or three seeds germinate, then you can thin those out, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. You can thin those out and actually have, you know, more plants than, than what you expected, which could be a good thing, no bad thing. We'll eat them. We'll eat them all. Yes, bro, it's good. So once you plant the seed, you kind of just, the, the soil will already be moist. So you want to, instead of watering with a watering can directly onto where you've just planted, because you don't want to drown the seed or it'll easily float to the top and you'll lose it, just take something like a spray bottle and spritz the top of the soil so the seed and the soil can make contact. And then we go right into Dell. Um, at that point, um, there are three important things to remember at that point are temperature, um, light, and water. Um, for the first few weeks of growth, light is not required. It's all about the temperature. There has to be a, a humid environment for the seed to sprout. Um, and that's where, at that point, we have... That's the case for a lot of varieties, but it's not for every variety. So make sure you, you know... Do a little bit of research or read the, like I said, the seed pack usually has that information on there. Because um, some, some, some seeds do better in different conditions. Like, we're going to tell you this, we can start, most seeds will start in, um, it doesn't necessarily need sun. 
you don't necessarily need sun to start seeds for the first two weeks. Some varieties of plants you, you, you need uh, sunlight all the time. So it's, you have to definitely know, you know, try to do a little research into what variety of plants you're, you're growing and how to, what, what the best conditions are. So this is the incubation time, you want to keep it warm um, in a dim place. Um, last year, I know that they sell heating pads to put under your cells or your flats or whatever you're going to use, but um, they recommend using the top of your refrigerator. It's enough out of the way of direct sunlight and it's warm and it works. Um, so that's going to stay like that until you see... Um, yeah, the first... Until you see a sprout. And at that point, you're going to remove the greenhouse, and that's when you want to introduce it to light and air. Um, yeah. And like, like with the, the greenhouse effect, like if you're using something like egg cards, you could easily cut this top part out and put plastic, uh, you know, like uh, saran wrap or any kind of plastic, and that'll help. Or you could just put it in a, in a, in a bag. It help retain the moisture yeah. in the mix exactly. so it doesn't dry out. Yeah. And what's the temperature? Like the temperature, is it noticeably warm that you're looking for or just warm? 70 to 75 is, is, uh, is ideal. You're going to see condensation inside the bag. That's how you know it's similar to a greenhouse. You know, yeah. a greenhouse. So 70 75, uh, you know, if it's a little bit over and under, it's, it's not going to kill it. But you, you definitely want it around that area. That's why, like, the refrigerator is a good idea because it does produce some heat. And um, like Kristen had mentioned, some people buy heating pads, or if, if you end up do putting it in front of a, like some kind of window or sunlight source, you can use like bricks or jugs of water because it um, holds the, it captures the temperature and it'll hold temperature a lot longer, and that will help. Um, you know, that's just one one thing that assists the plants to stay warm. Um, so at the point when you first see the first sprout, you're going to remove the greenhouse, but your average south-facing sunlight, sunlit window isn't going to be enough. So they recommend um, a grow light system or placing them, which is re a really easy system to put together. It's just fluorescent bulbs. And actually our next workshop is showing you how to build one. Yeah. The next workshop is going to be, I'm going to show you how to make a grow light that is inexpensive, phenomenal, and takes apart so you can put it away very small. And it is, I love my grow light, in fact, I'm building another one. So I'm going to have two grow lights in my kitchen. Not going to be any room for my husband and kids, but I'll have my plants and my grow lights. Yeah, we definitely have schedules around, and uh, hopefully we'll keep sending emails. So definitely look out for that. But um, one of the reasons why Kristen says that a south facing window isn't necessarily a lot is because they should have around 12 hours of sunlight, you know, per day. And yeah, you get a lot of light through a south facing window, but early mornings or getting late, the angle might be different. You're not going to get a full 12 hours usually. And also, a lot of windows are polarized, so then you're, you're, you're changing the spectrum of light as well. Light. Um, so light. And what's good about the grow light too is it's adjustable. So as your plants grow, you just kind of yeah, pull, the pull up, up and they, they grow and they can pull up or down. Yeah, that uh, that's another good point. Is those? It's on the back of the calendar. What is it? Is it? Yeah, I'm doing it the second. Not um, this week coming up, but the week after. Because <laughs> we so have it's spring on break. The calendar. And then but I, I will be handing out instructions with diagrams. It's. Is it PCB or PVC type? PVC. Yeah, I don't say it wrong. PVC. But it's like that. Find a husband or someone that's good to cut it out <laughs> for you. I, I, you know, Lowe's will do it. And all the dimensions will be there. And it's so, I mean, it's like doing Legos. It's so much fun to do. And if anybody wants, you, wants to build grow lights, you buy it, I'll build them. I love it. <laughs> I love doing it. Well, when you, like, you'll learn this at, at, in, in her workshop, but when, when you do use a grow light system, like the lights are going to be inches inches from this. So if you have your grow light and it's up here, it's yep. wrong. 
So you want it nice and low because you want make want to make sure that those seedlings are getting uh, great sunlight. Sometimes, um, and then it, then you also got to take into consideration like how many flats you have. So if you just have one row, two light bulbs might be fine, but if you get wider, you're going to need more bulbs because you're so close. And I've, I've definitely started plants without the grow light, just because I didn't have it yet. And I've used a south facing window, and you'll see that your plants get really tall and spindly really fast. You think, well, they're growing, but that's not a good sign that you're, you're, um, you're growing weak plants. Um, and the next important thing is to remember, oh, um, do you leave the grow light on 24 hours? Nope, 12, 12, hour, 12 hour light periods. Oh, well, that's, that's usually the, the most common. Again, more, more, a little bit more, a little bit less is not necessarily going to be a bad thing, but 12 hours is, is the optimum. I feel like more comes with time. So you just set it and forget about it. <laughs> For um, watering, you want to keep the, um, the soil moist, not soggy. And to accomplish that, it's best to water from from um, below, so that the plants are wicking up the moisture they need when they want it, when they need it. Um, and by this point, your plants should be growing, and when they're two inches tall, it's time to thin them. A little step to go back just a little bit. When you, when you, when you do have seedlings and you're indoors, because, but this is a, just a little trick, but you, if you put your hand across them, kind of like fan them, mimicking it'll, wind. it'll mimic wind and it'll help stronger, you know, strengthen the plants, the stems. And so it's just a little, you know, once a day. Do you have to play music while you're doing that? If you, if you want, whatever makes you feel comfortable. If you want to play music. Isn't it true that if you put a fan, you could do a fan, you just put a fan, an oscillating fan, you know, yeah. a couple of hours a day yeah. and change positions. Don't yeah. want to blow it all on one side because they'll get strong on one side and they'll... Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> matters. You, know, you, you can definitely do that. But if you want to conserve my energy... My <laughs> strong. If you want to conserve energy, just simply... And become one with your plants. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be part of the process. They're going to eat it. I forgot one step, sorry guys. Um, when your seedlings have two sets of leaves, when you want to start fertilizing. Um, and this is what they say is the best, and it's what I use, what I think yeah, Lee's awesome. Garden yep. Degree. Or, it's um, liquid fish yeah. fertilizer. Well, fish yeah. They're right in New Bedford, too. Yeah. 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 I was in the last year. It was phenomenal. So do I. It's Tabs you can buy, you just add water to. Are those any good for planting? Because I've seen those. Yeah, I, actually, when I was at the store looking at some of this stuff, I seen that those are, are very popular now. And they're cheap. And, um, well, they're cheap. It's yeah. Like $1.50. They're, they're actually, they are beneficial. They're coconut. That's another thing that's coconut uh, fibers. Yep. So it's it's fairly sustainable as well. I mean, the process of making them might, might not be the best, but... Um, yeah, the, you could definitely use them because they're small size, and as soon as you add water, they expand. Yeah. So it, that is definitely a good. Uh, okay. Good alternative. Yeah, if you want. Drop right into the ground. Anywhere. Like, yeah. Are they biodegradable when you go to plant transplant? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you could. It's it's, it's beneficial. It's going to help the soil. Compost outside and a homemade compost thing. Would I use that directly for the soil? You can. Yeah, I'm not worried about contaminants or anything like that. You were talking about. Oh, see, well, it matters the. You add water to them. Um, 
composting style that you're doing because you could do a hot compost or a that was probably thrown in there. Well, do you, have it, do you have it like turn it? Yeah, we did. Well, by turning it, what you're doing is aerating it, oxidizing everything. So you're doing more of a hot compost style. So that does kill a lot of a lot of um, bacteria and stuff. The you know the not good stuff. And it doesn't mean that it's definitely safe, but it's it, you know it's a lot it's a lot better than just going into your garden. No, 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 I didn't kill it. Oh, one thing. My mom used to grow seeds, but she used to start them, literally, just putting them in a little bit of water out in the windowsill and just waiting for the roots. And then she would put them into the dirt. Is that good for everything? Or cause she used to grow everything like that. I, some, I mean, of, some of the germination times and some seeds are long, so that's recommended to um, soak it overnight as, to jumpstart the process because it takes a long time. But that would be something that helps yeah. jumpstart them. Yeah. You, you could, you, yeah, you, you could definitely use that technique. It's people have done it. You know, older people have seen to do it. But everything. No matter yeah. what it was, it, everything went in a little cup in front of that window, and there was little roots, and that's when she put them in the, <laughs> the dirt. I was like, okay. So you want to check both? Make sure you label things. Um, another good thing to do is to remember to label what you're planting because you think you're going to remember, but oh, yeah. you don't. You don't, yeah. And I put some popsicle sticks and some pens if you want to note the variety and the date that you sewed it. That's important. Do you want us to cover over these little holes now? Oh, that's right. You got to cover them with a little, 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 yeah, usually you could just sprinkle like excess um, dirt on top of the hole. Yeah, but they can just push it in. Yeah, and yeah. pat it, and then it's pretty damp, so I don't know if you guys want to spray it, but it's pretty damp. Um, so, so after, oh, so I'll talk about. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get to that in a few seconds. You're not there yet. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about thinning that I mentioned earlier. So when when your your seedlings are about two inches tall, and you know you, you were lucky because all two or three of your seeds sprouted, what you do is thin. You can take uh, just a common fork, and you can remove it from the block that it's in and transplant it into its own. Its own little block, little cell. Um, very carefully. Very carefully. Yeah. And don't touch the stem. You just need to touch the leaf or the roots. Yeah, the, the stem is like similar to choking. <laughs> yeah, and, and the ones that you don't want to keep, you can easily just you cut it at the soil line. You can snip it right at the, the soil line. So what happens if you don't thin it? You're going to overcrowd the oh, space yeah, that. Then, you, then you're having two plants that are competing against each other. So, so you, survival of the fittest? Yeah, survival of the fittest, or you could have just two lousy plants. <laughs> well, it depends on what it is. Yeah. When you're dealing with the tropicals, it's a good idea to leave one, but if you're planting parsley and lettuce and all the mustards and all those, if you have two or three in a, together, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a big deal. And they, they do just fine together. But if it's a tropical and much sturdier plant, you want to just have one. Like a tomato or something. When you said yeah, it's definitely thinning them out, I heard fork, but I heard and I heard not stem. But so is it leaf or thin out by move, getting down to the roots and dividing it? Yeah, you can get down into the soil and separate That's the them. way. Okay. And you can use like, when you grab it. You don't want to like grab it by the stem and like yank it out basically. Got it. 
Yeah, so basically just look at what you have, decide which one's the strongest, um, and take a pair of scissors and snip at the soil line the ones that you don't want, so that that strong one has a chance to, you know, get the nutrients and have the space to kind of stretch out. So, so a after about a month or so, after you, 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 you sowed your uh, plants and your seedlings, and they're going pretty good, um, you're gonna, you, you want to inspect the roots. If the roots are starting um, you know, to fill the cell that they're in, you're going to want to uh, transplant them into, into their own, con a, a bigger container, like I was showing you with the little blocks, like you see it, it's filling up the cell, you're going to transplant it until it's, you know, if you're ready to put it directly into the ground, if it's, if it's past the frost date, then it, you know, then usually, well, if you do it a month, I guess, you'd still have two weeks, if you do six weeks. Um, yeah, so you're going to re retransplant them into a bigger size so they can have more room to grow. So our, our, each seedling should have its own cell or container, um, cow pots, stuff like that. And it sounds like early May or the second week of May is the, first, is the last frost date. So maybe we should be doing this around the first, the early in April. Okay. It's one to, for our own gardens, yeah. right? Depending on which what yeah. seed or what we're growing. That's what these charts are good. Six, six weeks is 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 a, is like the the standard. But like I said, some all varieties can be different. So you definitely want to look at that. So like I said, a lot of, a lot of times it's right on the back of the seed packet. They they handle it, you know good enough that they give you that information right there. It'll nice. tell you six weeks, six, seven weeks. And if, it's just, if the season says so, you might not plant so much oil there. You know, you still have frost, so. so. So to help put them into, transplant them into a different container, you're gonna place a, a thin layer of soil at the bottom of the pot. You're gonna remove the seedling from its cell and place it deep in the pot. All right, if you're doing tomato, tomatoes and it, it, you have long stems, they say it's, it's, uh, it's best to bury some of the stem because the plant will grow roots along the buried part of the stem. You get stronger plants. Kind of an awkward way of thinking, but if you know your tomato plant's going to grow really long and the stem's going to be really long, and then when you're ready to transplant, you're going to be like, okay, how deep am I digging the hole? But um, little sprouts will come off the tomato stem, so you can basically, like, say this is your tomato stem. When you dig your trench outside, you can just lay it flat and bury part of the stem to where you want it. You know, you don't have to like cut it or anything; just bury it and those spuds growing off of the tomato stem will root. So, and, and as soon as you're done transplanting, you're gonna go right back onto your grow lights. About one to two inches, you want the, your lights above, above the, the top leaves. And with some varieties, or sometimes uh, one side might grow faster or longer, so then you gotta compensate for that. Um, one technique that I heard was, uh, Dr. Corbin, he actually puts, like, he puts it up as high to accommodate the high ones, and the low ones, what he'll do is put something underneath to, to prop them up closer to the light. Or if you use micro light system, you can, if you're adjusting oh, yeah. this, you can just have it tilted. Yeah, they can be slanted too. Do. I'm sorry, guys, I've had so much So... Once all the danger of uh, the frost is passed, it's time. It'll be time to, to transplant. Usually, early, hopefully, early May. It'll be a time to transplant your, your seedlings into the garden. What you want to do is harden them off by giving them gradually increased ex exposure to sunlight. So, day one, you'll have you, you give them one hour of sunlight. Day two, two hours, 
day three, you could jump to, to four hours. Day five, four hours. Day six and seven, six plus hours. And um, Yeah. The idea is to gradually expose them to what the real conditions. Yeah, they're acclimation. Be Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They get, they're going to be up for the 12 hours outside. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. So yeah, that exactly. They'll, it'll, you put them back under the grow lights for the time that they're not in the sun. It, it's just, it's like a slow acclimation process. But you don't want to stop that that 12 hours of light. Right. But you don't need the whole 12 hours. I don't do it anyway. But the whole 12 hours of the grow light. You got 12 hours under the grow light. You might take them out for an hour. So you got 11 hours under the grow light. Yeah. Exactly. Then yeah. two hours. You got 10 hours under the grow light. Yeah. So as long as it equals 12 hours of, of some form of light. Yeah. But the thing is, if it's overcast and very warm, and it's I mean, you have to use your common sense too. Yes. If it's overcast, you have to worry about the sun. If there's no wind, you just watch the plant. You might be able to leave it out a little longer, but if it's really sunny. Make sure it's in the shade, it's not the direct side of the first part of it because you don't want it to get burnt. Right. So it's, it's yeah, just, you definitely got to watch it because you, you don't want to stop burning it. Aim for kind of like a dreary day or <laughs> something to set it up. To start off. Yeah. So that's basically it. Now you're in the ground and you just continue to water and fertilize with the diluted fish emulsion. Um, can put some compost around the base of the plant, give it some added nutrients, and your seed packet should tell you harvest times, um, etc. Well, it's the same. We've got to talk about drain plants to the ground. Oh, I thought that was. <laughs> we skipped. The, we skipped the part. Sorry, skipped the part. Oh, we tried to organize it, but. Um, yeah. So when your seedlings are. You know, about a foot tall more, and you know the frost is done. You want to plant them roughly, you know, six inches deep, and you can bury the low part of the stem. Pinch off the low branches and leaves to avoid burying any any of the foliage to prevent uh, any rot. So you could you could definitely use a the trench method. Which you dig an eight inch deep six inch wide trench if you're doing tomatoes and that will help you uh, be able to bury some of the stems and basically you do the same thing as if you were transplanting, transplanting into a pot you transplant it into the ground and then right back to oh do you want to explain a little bit about the fish emulsion to help you use it yeah. also it's also water that would be more than you're going to use Oh yeah, so this is like pure, that on pure it. fish stink. Don't want to fill it on anything that you value. Maybe an ex-husband, you know, former brother-in-law, but not anybody else. But all you need is a really tiny bit and you're going to dilute it. Because if you're going to start fertilizing in the house and it's a hot summer day, even with the windows open, it's going to stink. It's stinks, but it goes to the water. But I don't use that much. You just shake it and then just wash it and take a shower after. So if, if, if you do if you do this technique and use something like this or the paper uh, before you transplant it, you, know, you should rip the bottom. Although it, it'll degrade in the ground, it's still slightly a barrier. So if you take off the bottom, it'll it'll help. That you know, that when, you, when you're using the egg cotton, I just started some yesterday actually with the kids, but um, grandchildren. But what I do is I, as I'm eating my eggs, I crack, when I crack it, I make sure I crack it with the top, the small yep. top, and I put the eggshell on each one so they get that added oh, calcium yeah. yep. and, and phosphorus and everything so the roots have some added nutrition. Yeah. Get I, I've seen people, I've seen a picture in a magazine that they actually use just the yeah, egg. Yeah, the eggshell, egg yeah. They take the top part of the egg uh, shell off and then they, they yeah. put all the little compost of dirt yeah, right in there so and they do the whole process right, right there. That yeah, you can throw that right to the ground. The kids like it. Yep. Yeah.
what did you stop planting? Just out of curiosity, what do you plant this early? What do you, do you plant this early? Um, I put in some um, tangent marigolds, and I'm trying to think what else. I planted lavender, peppers, thyme. Um, this is all in the house. Yeah, you can get your peas in now. You should have your spinach in now. You can get your in now. Um, a lot of stuff. First of all, we put the ground not frozen. No, the ground. In the ground. That's for us. In the ground. Well, it all depends on, you have to really investigate the seed or read the back of the thing because there's certain hardiness levels of plants. Just one more quick tip, tip about watering once it's in the ground, especially when you're watering fish emulsion or watering, try to get down there and water right around the root of the plant, not like all over the leaves because you don't want to be harboring like disease like in the leaves. You want to just put the water where it's needed, right, right at the root of the plant. Um, so like we said, there's lots of information online. I hope that this was helpful. And, oh, any questions? Yeah, just a simple question. What if I had a sudden heat and dash bubble call around and check on the edge of the edge? What point did he make decisions? I'm able to check on the wood. I just made it, but they were like this big and they were pretty off. I'd say don't leave until after they're. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you have to leave, then you have to leave them. I mean, if you have, a, if you have like the grow light system, I mean, if you set a timer. They'll, they'll do their own thing. I mean, you can set up a fan and, and the lights on a timer if you wanted. Um, they also have uh, some particular trays that uh, have a water wicking device built in. Yeah. That, uh, so that it keeps them warm. Basically, the process we discussed. Yeah, I mean the yep, you know, water would probably be the unless you get like some some kind of water self watering thing. Yeah, it happens. Um, but what happened a meeting? We're having a meeting right after this. We try to have meetings every Wednesday. Usually it's in one of the, these classrooms or somewhere else. But if anybody, you know, you're all, everybody's welcome to come and join us and try to make things happen. So that's the conclusion of your presentation. Yes.